Namaste and welcome to Indian History and Archaeology with me, Dr. Lajwanti Shani. You've heard about Mesopotamian sea trade with Meluha or the Sindhu Saraswati civilization on this channel itself. In this presentation, I will be talking about the textual evidence for this trade, which comes from the Mesopotamian cuneiform texts in what I call their shopping list. To begin with, a very brief geographical location of Mesopotamia. It is today's Iraq. And now to understand why the Mesopotamian civilization had such an insatiable need for exotic imports from the outside world, we need to know how their society developed. Also, I'd like to invite you to identify or infer any similarities or dissimilarities with the Indian civilization. And before we carry on, I'd like to request you to please hit the like button below this video, which will help this video to reach other viewers faster as well. During the 7th to 5th millennia BCE, as the early humans emerged from the Neolithic era, there were developments taking place around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in Mesopotamia. Two cultures developed there more or less simultaneously, with city-states ruled from the temple or ziggurat, which was the seat of power in each of these cities, which had its own reigning deity. Halaf culture, named after the type site of Tel Halaf, was a farming and pastoralist society which emerged in northern Mesopotamia and Syria with painted pottery from around 6,500 to 5,500 BCE. Sites relating to this culture were found at Tel Aprachia, Tepe Gaura, Tel Amarna and Shagar Bazar in the fertile Khabur Valley. Other famous sites of this culture included Nineveh, Nimrud, Asur and Imgur Enlil. And then we have the Ubaid culture, which we are more familiar with in relation to the Harappan sea trade, particularly, which developed in the flat alluvial plains of southern Mesopotamia between the 6th and 5th millennia BCE. Some of the well known sites of the southern region are Uruk, Sumer, Akkad, Isin Larsa. Lagash and Babylon, which is more or less in the middle of uh, Mesopotamia. And Babylon, of course, came up much, much later. In fact, after the sea trade had ended. Some of these cities also became the center of various empires in the Mesopotamian civilization. All of these city-states were dominated by a temple culture and had their own ziggurat, which is part of a temple complex, and belonged to a god or goddess related to that particular city, which in turn ruled over the entire civilization for the period while that city-state held the seat of power. Sounds complicated? It's not. Succession of power between the city-states was absolutely smooth, at least in the initial part of the civilization. It's only towards the end of the Mesopotamian civilization that we see wars taking place, but that's for later. These temples were managed by a priest class and archaeologists working in Mesopotamia came to believe that these were priest kings and that all governance and trade was carried out from these ziggurats. However, Mesopotamian cities have been classified in three types, religious, royal and commercial. Something we see in almost every country today. The earliest known temple was built in Eridu, dating around 5500 BCE. And scholars have described it as a small room with a cult niche and an offering table during that time. Not much is known about Mesopotamia's interactions with the West, which is West Asia, 
which would of course be through northern Mesopotamia. But the possibility is supported by the presence of a few grave finds and precious stones like emerald and sapphire, which possibly came from Turkey. The Harappans were also probably reaching the Ubaid city-state and some of the northern cultures via the land route which went through Central Asia around the 5th millennium BC. This was when the lapis lazuli trade had begun. Elam, or modern Iran, which is located bang in the middle of the Central Asian land route, had developed its own unique culture with some similarities with Mesopotamia, in particular its temple culture. But they went on to build some of the grandest temple structures in the world, especially during the Persian Empire of the early historic period. During the earlier period, though, we do have some evidence of trade passing via Elam, that is from the Harappan region to Mesopotamia, going via Elam. But at some point, this stopped and Elam isolated itself completely from all its neighbors. In fact, it turned hostile, apparently, at least to Mesopotamia. And they continue to survive and possibly even thrive until the early historic period when the Persian kings spread out with the expansionist wars. Coming back to Mesopotamia, in the city of Akkad, we have textual evidence of King Sargon, who ruled over the city-state and thereby the entire land. Sumer and Akkad were both contemporary to mature Harappan period of the Sindhu Saraswati civilization. In fact, the sea trade began to flourish during the Sumerian period and continued right up till the end of the Akkadian Empire. Besides the archaeological evidence that we have for this sea trade network from the Harappan region as well as the Oman Peninsula, we also have historical record coming from Mesopotamia. Moreover, Harappans were probably even living in the city of Sumer, possibly in small colonies. This has been inferred from some cuneiform texts, as well as a cylindrical seal, which gives the pictographic evidence for it. As you can see from the sealing or the impression of the seal in a clay ceiling, we have men from Meluha being presented before the king. But we also have long lists of trade items which arrived on the Meluha ships. This is what I call the Mesopotamians shopping list. An inscription by King Gude of Lagash gives reference to a man involved with a ship of Meluhan type. This text has been deciphered as a list of rations dealt with in context of a ship and a man called Son of Meluha. Translations in Enki and the World Order, this is more of a command really. Enlil is a Mesopotamian god of the atmosphere. He is also one of the triad of gods, the other two being Anu and Ea or Enki. Another translation from Enki and Ninhursag. These are royal shopping lists, so I think we can bear with the commanding tone. Here's another slide which gives us an enumeration of boats from different countries or entities in which the word Ma is repeated as can be seen here. The third dynasty texts from Ur during the reign of Ibisin II give inventories of trade which mention the articles bartered for copper. As you can see, this text speaks of goods garments in particular, issued from the storehouse, perhaps belonging to the temple, to be bartered for copper, which is to be purchased from Magan on behalf of the temple. Lu Enlila is apparently the agent who has received the goods from the storehouse administrator Daja. More items mentioned here, which also come from the temple of Nana for the purchase of copper. The agent or merchant, again, is Lu Enlila. 
But this time there's also another man, a courier. An interpretation offered by some scholars is that Lu Enlila could be the ruler of Magan. Clearly, he is receiving the Mesopotamian goods in exchange for copper. Interestingly, the tablet on which this was written, perhaps a bill of lading or a bill of shipping in today's language, was put in the ship or sent on the ship going to Magan. However, we don't have any archaeological evidence of any such tablet in either the Oman Peninsula or the Harappan region. Who knows, there just might be some yet to be found. And now to conclude this presentation, the sea trade, as documented in these texts and archaeological records across the Old World, was directed mainly to the wealthy elites of the palaces and temples of Mesopotamia. The common man was perhaps the least of the recipients of this trade activity, which according to Professor Purcell was mainly directed to build and maintain the Mesopotamian cult system. The Mesopotamian and Harappan civilizations were the two giants at the fore of the mobilization that took place in the mid-3rd millennium BC. While we've seen here that the recipients were the Mesopotamian elites, the Harappan culture, on the other hand, was far more egalitarian. Besides the fact that we haven't found any kind of riches, whether imports or regional, at any of the Harappan sites. I would like to go further on Professor Purcell's line of thought and say that this elite trade was perhaps the genesis of modern Western capitalism. Mesopotamia did not have any natural resources to offer for trade and had few possible exports such as wool, what appears to be garments of high quality, leather, and sesame oil. For the most part, it appears to be a consumer society. While looking outward for resource procurement or even procuring high quality jewels for its elites, the Mesopotamians were also colonizing other lands like Dilmun and Magan at some point of time, as seen in the Persian Gulf. And with that, I leave you with a lot to think about and I hope you'll share your thoughts on this topic in the comment section below the video. Do click on the like button, share the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so yet. Plus, if you click on the bell icon, you will receive notifications of all our videos. Thank you so much for joining me today. Namaste. Thank you.